Okay, so um, a member of this class got in touch with me last week and um, and said that they were having trouble applying the paint to our um, canvas board. So they found it to be uh, very rough and difficult to spread the paint. So um, there are two ways to deal with that. One of them is um, by using uh, mediums. So I, I, as you all know, on the material list, um, I included an optional set of materials that you could buy if you were interested in using mediums. And I know a couple people have done that. Um, so um, I will talk about those in a minute, but there's another thing you can do if anyone else is having trouble with um, the surface, if you find it to be a difficult surface to work on. And a lot of artists would find these canvas boards um, when they're just, um, when they just come out of their packaging, um, a lot of artists would find it difficult or if nothing else would not like working on that rough surface. I actually don't like working on that rough surface. Um, and actually before I do my demo every day, I alter this surface. Now I haven't included that in my discussions in the class because um, I didn't, I don't want to throw too much at people. I feel like I throw a lot um, at people. Um, but since someone asked, I'm going to talk about this. So um, the, the issue with this is, first of all, it, it's not a terribly good surface to work on. We're working on this because this is beginning painting and because um, it's in, relatively inexpensive. But it, you know, it's pretty cheap. Um, this, the canvas that, that is stretched over this board is not the best. The primer they use um, is certainly not the best. And um, what, what, what I mean by primer, um, a, a priming is the word that's used to describe the white surface that is painted onto the canvas before we use it. So with oil painting, virtually always, an artist will prime the surface before they put the paint down. Our artists actually do many different things to the surface, but at the very least, an artist will prime it. So primer, it's the same, same exactly the same word, the same purpose as primer in house painting. It's a, a layer of paint that, that is put down that makes uh, makes the conditions optimum or best for the paint to adhere to the surface you're working on. So the most common primer that artists use goes by the name of gesso, G-E-S-S-O. I know my film production is not the best. If, if I was doing this high production values, this would be better illuminated. But anyway, um, this is a relatively affordable um, gesso. Um, so I don't ask people to buy this. I actually do ask you to buy it when we do this class at, on campus because I actually have everybody prepare a surface, a much better surface than these. Um, but if, if, you, if anybody here has not liked this surface, has found it to be too rough and not um, very amenable to the application of paint, you can do two things. One is a very easy thing to do. Um, go out and buy some sandpaper, or you can buy one of these um, sanding sponges. So these sanding sponges are made by 3M, other companies make them. Um, and um, a, a sanding sponge is, it's, it's a sponge that's lined with sandpaper. Um, give me one second. You could also just buy sand. Sorry, just want to point this out. 
You could also just buy sandpaper, a right? piece of sandpaper, and you know a sanding block if you want to do that. You don't have to have a sanding block. Um, so um, you could take your sandpaper. Really, I would cut it normally, but um, so you can take your sandpaper or your sanding sponge and just sand your surface to take off some of that edge or some of that rough, um, you know, that rough edge of the canvas. So um, it's easiest to sanding sponge. I find it much easier sanding sponge. These cost about three or four dollars, maybe cheaper depending on where you go. You can get them at any hardware store, any Home Depot, any paint supply store, anything like that. And you can just give your surface a light sand. And so I'm, I'm sanding going in circular motion like this. Just go over it a couple times. And you take off some of that, that sort, you know, that relatively rough edge. Now, ideally, you, you can also, by the way, a, a piece of sandpaper is cheaper than one of these. You know, these cost a buck or something like that. And so you can just cut it. I actually wouldn't rip it. I just did that because I didn't want to waste too much of your time. Um, cut it and then just fold it in half and you can use it like this. This sandpaper is rougher. You can see that um, that stuff come off. So okay. Um, um, and already, that's a nicer surface. It's a smoother surface. I much prefer that. Some artists do. That's a. This is a preference thing. Some artists prefer that rougher feeling. So some artists will deliberately use rougher canvas. Um, to paint on. It's really an issue of preference. So I go one step further. I have um, gesso. And so gesso is um, so um, So gesso is just, um, it's just white primer, white acrylic primer. And I, um, I take a two inch brush and I put a layer, uh, one layer, one more layer of gesso on, um, just to give it an, an extra sealing, an extra coat. I'm not gonna do it here. Um, I, I could do this demo sometime if anyone wants me to, I'm not really set up to do it. Um, I, I will show you that um, if anybody's interested, I'm going to do with this, this without the paint, but the way I would recommend applying the paint, don't just do it kind of casually like you're painting your front porch or something like that. Um, I, I always apply the paint by starting at the center and moving out in a kind of um, all over direction like this, moving out from the center so that I don't get these kind of like comb-like lines, you know, that you sometimes kind of get when you just do this. I try to avoid that. I try to put down a, 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 um, a smooth surface. So again, I sort of, it's, it's, it's almost more like scrubbing than it is like painting out from the center um, until my surface is covered. Um, and then I have a nicer, or at least for me, for my taste, a nicer surface to work on. So that's something you can do. You can sand it, that's the simplest thing. You can go one step further and buy some gesso. This, I don't remember how much this costs, probably four or five dollars, something like that. Um, so um, that's my recommendation. There are, um, there are tutorials online that will show you how to 
just so a canvas. Some are better, some are worse. Um, I can, uh, if I have time today, I'll do some research and find the better ones. If I have time, I'm not going to guarantee that. Um, so anyway, those are two options. Um, I, I would go so far as to recommend doing that be, just because these surfaces are, um, you know, mass produced, they're made, you know, for, they're made only as well as they need to in order to be able to sell them. Um, they're, de they're perfectly decent for, for what we're doing, but they're, they're certainly not a beautiful surface to work on. And, and for anyone who is interested in going further in painting, you're going to eventually find that there are some surfaces that are really beautiful to work on. You know, you just, you, you try them and, and you don't go back. Um, you know, but that's maybe more, a more advanced thing. Okay, so that's, that's uh, how to deal with the surface. Okay, so the second thing um, I mentioned, or I, you know, I've talked about this, are mediums. So um, here are the two components I asked you to buy. Um, so the, the, these two components here, these are two different types of oil. So I, 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 I didn't ask you to buy this. I recommended if anyone was interested. Um, so here, one of them is called liquin, and then linseed oil. Uh, linseed oil is the oil that um, our paint is ground in. So this paint, all this paint is, is um, a, a powdered pigment. In this, in this case here, it's red, cadmium red. A powdered pigment ground in linseed oil. That's all oil paint is, at least high quality oil paint. Some cheaper brands put extenders in it. Um, but in theory, that's all oil paint is. You take oil, linseed oil. It's a, it's a kind of vegetable oil that dries when it's exposed to air. So linseed oil um, and powdered pigment. And that's what, we're, that's what we paint with. Stand oil is another option. Um, stand oil is linseed oil, but it's, how, did, how exactly do they make it? I think they boil it in the absence of, oil, of oxygen. I might be wrong about that. They somehow treat it. I don't know where I got that. There's some painting material that's boiled in the absence of oxygen. Um, but um, you know, I, I think I'm gonna find out later today that I'm totally wrong about that. So I should edit this, but it's in the back of my mind. Anyway, stand oil is a kind of linseed oil. Linseed oil is relatively, uh, relative, it, it flows more, it's more fluid than stand oil. I'll show you what I mean. So um, I use linseed oil. Um, so linseed oil is a little bit thinner where um, stand oil, and our, some artists prefer this, has a little bit more of a honey light -like texture. You know, it comes out a little bit more stringy like that. Um, and I, you know, I, to be honest with you, I, I don't remember the exact reason some people use stand oil over linseed oil. It's a preference thing. I used to use stand oil. I should look into, um, I should remind myself of the reasons I always use those different things. So, um, Either one, linseed oil or stand oil. Okay, so, so um, you can purchase these materials and then mix them together to get this medium I use. And, and when, you, when you use a medium, so I'll show you a couple things. So, um, I'm going to put out some, um, this is some titanium white, it's a certain, certain brand. Of titanium. So that titanium white 
is very thick. Maybe I should take, I mean, it's not going to show up on the surface. I'll take a different color. It's titanium white. This tube is so old that the cap doesn't work anymore. Okay, so. Take some of my cabinet. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Are you saying we're supposed to mix the medium and the linseed oil together and then use it, or we use them separately at the same time? Mix them together. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay? okay. Talk about that in more detail in a minute. Okay. So the reason medium is used. So let's just say. Okay, so I have my um, I have my paint fresh out of the tube. So I, I want to put down this cadmium red and the, the paint out of the tube. Um, it, it it goes down in a somewhat you know it's hard to it's hard to get that to spread on the surface, right? Now I can do a couple things. I can dip my brush in mineral spirits. So I have here a little jar of mineral spirits. I can dip my brush in that. And that's going to thin um, that paint and make it easier to spread. Okay. Um, now the, the disadvantage to this is what I have done is I've taken mineral spirits which as you all know by now, I think, um, mineral spirits thins the oil paint. So what it actually does is it breaks down the oil and um, it, it in effect extracts or removes some of the oil from the paint layer. So when this dries, it's going to dry kind of chalky and matte. And a lot of artists don't like that. Now, again, some artists do. So it, it's, a, it's an issue of preference. But if you want to be able to thin your oil paint and put it down on the surface so that it retains its gloss and that kind of particular glowing characteristic that oil paint has, you, you may want to use medium. So I use medium when I paint. So I, this, this medium I use is a mixture of these two ingredients plus mineral spirits. And so I can dip my brush in the medium, take some of that red paint, which is very stiff when it's right out of the tube, but I little, put a little bit of medium in it and it becomes much easier to spread. Now what's gonna happen is the, the paint that I have thinned with mineral spirits, when it dries, it's gonna be, become relatively dull and matte. The paint that I have thinned with medium is gonna retain that um, vibrance and that glow of oil paint. So that's a question of your preference. Do you want to retain that glow or do you want the paint to dry more matte? Most people want oil paint to have that kind of glistening, um, uh, that glistening transparent glow. You know, that's, that's why people choose oil paint. Um, medium, so medium is just a substance that we add to, to our paint to alter the properties of the paint and allow for a greater range of applications. So I can put a little bit of medium in it and spread it relatively easily like that. Again, I can do the same thing with mineral spirits, but the more mineral spirits I put into paint, so this is just mineral spirits now, the more mineral spirits, the more I diminish the oil content of the, of the final layer. And it's gonna dry much more matte. Um, you know, again, where the, the paint that I've used, just oil is, gonna, is going to dry um, and retain that kind of gloss and that glow. Um, 
so um, this so this will help you be able to spread and manipulate the paint materials. So um, let me show you one other thing. Can we use both or should we just use one or the other? I'm sorry? Can we use both or can we use what like, or should we just use one or the other? Well, let me, um, let me address that in a second. That's a really good question and a really important question. There's a, there is a traditional technique in oil painting and I'll, I'll show you a couple of examples where, um, an artist will start by making a black and white painting. So this is an old demonstration I did for um, actually the very lesson we're doing today. Um, at one time, artists would, artists would make paintings by first doing a black and white or a brown and white, what's called an underpainting. And then the, the color would be applied in transparent layers. Um, on top of the black and white underpainting. So, put out some yellow over. So let's, so the artist starts by create, creating um, or establishing, I'm gonna move my camera this. Well, hold on. No, I'll just do it like this. The artist starts with a black and white painting like this. Um, and then the artist will apply color in thin layers of transparent paint. So what I've done is I've thinned my yellow ochre here. And then I'm going to apply yellow ochre, a thin layer of yellow ochre to this underpainting. And what happens is the underpainting and the way I resolve the form of the underpainting remains. So we can still see the modeling using light and shadow. Um, and we've given, we've created, now we've created a fully rendered image by applying a thin layer of color to an underpainting. And um, this was a technique that was used for a couple reasons. So now I have that under, underpainting layer. I mean, I have now that layer, this is called by the way, a glaze, G-L-A-Z-E. Now I have a layer of glaze that's a thin layer of oil paint over that black and white underpainting. And because I've put the layer down thinly, the, the modeling using black and white to create shades of light and dark, that modeling is still visible. Now this technique um, is used in, a mul in multiple, for a number of different reasons. Um, one reason is it cre helps to create or emphasize that characteristic glow of an oil paint. Because what's happening is we are seeing, we're perceiving these color changes and those value changes because light is passing through those transparent layers of paint, reflecting off the, the, the white primer underneath, bouncing off that white primer and then coming back to our eye. And so the passage of that light 
through those transparent layers of color has an effect similar to the effect that you experience when you look at a stained glass window. You're looking at light passing through transparent layers of color. So it has that glow of, um, you know, that glow that comes from the light passing through transparent color. So you can increase that sense of um, that kind of glowing characteristic of oil painting. Um, I, it, you know, I, I glazed over this entire thing. It's very possible that an artist would have used the yellow ochre in the lights and then mixed up a different color for the darks. Um, but this is the basic approach, okay? Um, and if you, if people take time to go to the Metropolitan Museum of Art um, or to the Frick collection to look at the, those pre 20th century paintings in those collections, spend some time asking yourself, does the painting look like it was possibly created with a, a monochrome, black and white, brown and white. Sometimes artists will use green and white. And that's called, that's a particular technique called verdaccio. Um, ask yourself, does it look like the painting could have been created um, in that technique? So um, it, if you're interested in doing glazing, you really need to use media. You can't really effectively glaze by thinning the paint with mineral spirits. Um, so starting to use a medium is a very, um, you know, it, it increases the range of things you're able to do in oil paint. Any questions about that or anything about that? Professor, do you need a lot of it? Do you need what? A lot of mineral, a uh, lot of medium. Uh, like a dip, I guess, as per, as while you're painting throughout. It doesn't, this lasts a long time. Yeah. No, I okay. talk to the author every now and again, but no, I guess the answer is no. I never really thought about that, but no because this will last a long time. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, what is the mixing ratio? Is it one by one by one? I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask you to, uh, um, to say that again. What, I'm sorry, what did you say? Uh, what's the mi mixing ra ratio for okay. the medium? So I'm gonna go over that right now. Okay. I mean, just the question of how long does it last this year this is my container of um, the medium that I've mixed up. That'll last me a, a month or so, a couple months. Um, okay. So it lasts. I understand, like a large jar of that, and yeah. then you sparingly use it. Exactly. That's it. Okay. Right. Thank you so much. Sure. So, um, okay. The ratio. So that's an important question. Let me, I'm going to pull up, um, let me just for a second pull up a document I have. Getting the medium was optional though, correct? It was optional, that's right. So to glaze, if we don't have the medium, I know you said we can't effectively do it with the mineral spirits, but is that kind of what we have to work with? You, you really can't glaze with just mineral spirits, not in any, um, You can't really glaze. I mean, I suppose you could, but you know, but the but when that glaze dries because it's been so thinned with oil paint, it's going to be very matte and dull. And I think more than anything, it's going to sort of conceal um, the underpainting. You know, almost like you put a sheet of sort of foggy glass over something. Does it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't think it'll be very effective. I think if you want to, if you want to glaze. Uh, you really should get a medium. Okay, thank you. Sure. So I will, for anybody who's interested in mediums, I'm going to post this document. I wrote it myself. This is my document. Um, everyone can see this, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. So um, oil painting medium. So let, let me just read a few of these things um, just because certain things are going to be brought up that are important. Okay, so oil painting medium is a liquid that can be added to paint during the painting process. It is usually composed of a drying oil, um, which is linseed oil, a resin, 
which is the liquid that I asked you to buy, a resin or varnish, and a solvent. So in our case, it would be mineral spirits. Oil painting medium allows a painter to alter the property of the paint. The paint can be made more fluid for easier application without losing its color intensity. Another word, a commonly used word in painting for color intensity is chroma. The language of painting borrows a lot of words from Italian um, and some to a lesser extent French. Um, oil paint can, can help prevent a matte chalky surface that can result when paint is thinned with solvent alone. And, allow, and it allows for transparent paint layers in glazing and scumbling techniques. So I mentioned glazing, what I just did. Gl glazing is technically painting a thin layer of a darker color over a lighter color. Scumbling, this word here, is technically painting a thin layer of a lighter color over a darker color. Okay, okay so recipes for oil painting medium. Here's where the question about ratios comes in. There are many recipes for oil painting mediums and there have been countless attempts to create the perfect medium for various techniques. The range of possible mediums is far too great to get into he to here. I'm gonna offer two possibilities, a standard traditional recipe and a version of that recipe that uses modern, safer from a health perspective and arguably longer lasting, more stable materials. So this is a traditional recipe. This is a recipe that, you, that you'll find in a well-known book on painting techniques called The Artist's Handbook of Materials and Techniques by Ralph Meyer. And um, the recipe he gives is one part stand oil, one part Damar varnish, and five parts turpentine. So turpentine, I, I think a lot of people probably know what that is. That's an old fashioned solvent that artists used to use instead of mineral spirits. We now use mineral spirits usually because turpentine is usually not allowed to be used in art schools anymore. And then this recipe gives 15 drops of cobalt dryer. That's a, it's a, a derivative, I guess, of cobalt. Um, and it, it, you can add a little bit to your paint to make it dry faster. Um, I highly recommend, in spite of the fact that Ralph Meyer uses it, recommends it, I highly recommend, or I discourage people from using it because it probably causes the paint layers to crack. So I, I wouldn't use cobalt dryer. That's a traditional medium. And certainly if you were interested in exploring traditional mediums, you could get this stuff. You can get Damar varnish at any, any art supply store. Um, as you know, you can get stand oil at any art supply store, turpentine, you can get it any, you can still get it at any hardware store or Home Depot. Um, in, this, in this recipe, you have to use turpentine because Damar varnish will not dissolve in mineral spirits. It only dissolves in turpentine. Okay, so the modern recipe, this is what I would recommend starting with. One part linseed or, or stand oil, one part liquin or galkid, Galkid is another, another um, synthetic resin that's easily obtainable nowadays. Um, the, the traditional recipe, Damar varnish, is the traditional resin that's used. Damar varnish is a resin that comes from pine trees. So probably most people have had this experience if you've, you've been, you've for whatever reason, been next to a tree and you put your hand on the tree and your hand gets all sticky from that kind of gummy secretion that you find on trees, particularly pine trees. That's what they make Damar varnish from. They collect that gummy secretion and um, they somehow process it into crystals. And then those crystals are dissolved in turpentine and that creates Damar varnish. And that's the, that's the varnish that used to be used it's the traditional varnish that was used centuries ago. Um, so liquin or galkid has replaced that. So the, the proportion I recommend is one part linseed or stand oil, one part liquin or galkid, three parts odorless mineral spirits or gansol. 
So um, who asked me about the proportions? Uh, me. Okay, so when I say one part linseed oil, one part liquid, three parts odorless mineral spirits, do you know what I mean by that? When I say one part to three yeah, parts? One by one by three. Yes. So, um, it, yeah, so one, so, you know, like if you're, let, let's say you're using um, a, some kind of container, uh, let's say you're using a small Dixie cup to, me to measure out your medium. You would use one Dixie cup full of linseed oil, one Dixie cup full of liquid, three Dixie cups, odorless mineral spirits, and so on. Or if you're using a measuring cup, it would be one ounce, one ounce, three ounces, or three ounce, three ounces, nine ounces, and so on. Okay. Any, can I clarify what is meant by one part to one part to three parts for anybody who's interested in this? Didn't you just do that? Yeah, I just clarified that, but I just want to make sure that, you know, I, I just want that to be clear, so. Okay, I have a question. With yeah, the Dixie ahead. cup, we're not filling the Dixie cup completely up, no? Well, you might be if you're, if you're making a large, if you're making like a large- Like, like that jar. large jar you have. Well, exactly. Okay, okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, so here's, so this is the, this is the mixture I recommend. So let, let me just point out some variations. So each of the, the ingredients in an oil painting medium affect the paint layer in the following ways. So this is important. Oil, standard linseed oil, will help maintain the color intensity and gloss of the paint layer while slowing down the drying time. So if you do nothing but put oil into your paint, you're gonna make for a, a very, very slow drying paint surface. Even more, it will dry even more slowly than the, the paint straight out of the tube. And so that's what oil does. In addition to helping maintain the color intensity, it slows down the drying time. So the varnish or resin, so that would be the liquid or galkid, um, Damar varnish, liquid or galkid, will also help maintain the color intensity and gloss of the paint layer while accelerating or speeding up the drying time. The solvent mitigates the full effect of the two previous ingredients. So it, it, um, it acts as a kind of countermeasure to these. Now, the reason I, I put in, I, I point these properties out is let's say you, you try my medium and you decide that you would rather have a medium that dries a little bit faster. You could then start using a medium that has more varnish in it than I have recommended. So you could perhaps make a medium that has one part linseed oil, two parts liquid and three parts mineral spirits. That will make the paint layer dry a little bit faster. If you want the paint layer to dry more slowly than this medium allows for, you could add more oil. You do have the option of adjusting these proportions. Okay. You don't want to do it too much because that you run into trouble. You could also add more solvent to this. You could use one part linseed oil, one part liquid, five parts solvent if you wanted a, a medium that um, is a little bit less glossy, let's say. So you can, I would recommend starting with this mixture and then you over time decide, um, you know, what is best for you, okay? So then this is a very important cautionary note. Okay, so people have probably gone to a museum and have seen paintings that have cracks on them. And sometimes paintings are highly cracked. Um, there is some risk in using oil painting medium because the more stuff you add to oil paint, the more you run the risk of creating a layer of paint that has flaws in it. So the more you run the risk of creating a layer of paint that might crack, or peel, 
especially if you don't use medium in the right way. So if you're going to use medium, you have to observe a few rules um, to, to ensure that you don't create a painting that has flaws. In other words, that has flaws in the paint layer. So, um, okay, so let me just read this. Using painting medium increases the likelihood that your paint layers, I should say can increase the likelihood if you use it in, improperly that your paint layers will be impermanent, that they may crack, flake off, or otherwise prove unstable over time. The best way to avoid these possibilities is to never use painting medium. That's the best way to avoid that, to just use paint out of the tube. Having said that, painting mediums have been used by many, if not most artists since the beginning of oil painting, sometimes with disastrous results. So if people know Leonardo's famous painting, The Last Supper, that's a good example of uh, the disastrous results of the improper use of painting mediums. So Leonardo's Last Supper, anyone familiar with that painting? Yes, yes. I'm looking it up right now. Yeah, look it up, it's famously degraded. Um, you know, much of it has been lost. Um, Leonardo loved to experiment, um, but that experiment went, experimentation sometimes went awry. More often than not though, oil painting medium has been used successfully. If they are be, to be used successfully, the following steps should be taken. Follow the fat over lean rule. So that's an old term in painting, fat over lean. So what does that mean? A fat layer of paint is a layer that has more oil in it. A lean layer is a layer that has less oil in it. If a painting is made with lean layers on top of fat layers, it is almost certain that the painting will crack, will flake off, or will have other problems with stability. When you add medium to oil paint, you are making it fatter. You should always therefore make sure that when using medium, you never apply a layer of paint with less medium, a lean layer over a layer with more medium, a fat layer. So to answer the question about whether you can mix the use of thinning paint with mineral spirits and thinning it with oil, the answer is no. In other words, you can't one day make put down a layer of paint with medium in it, and then the next day put down a layer of paint that doesn't have medium in it, because that's guaranteed to create a situation where paint peels or cracks. So once you start using the medium, you have to use it consistently throughout the painting process. It is advisable to start a painting with no medium in it at all, thinning the paint when necessary with nothing but solvent, and then into later layers start adding medium. So you can do that. You can start a painting, thinning it with only mineral spirits and then use medium. But once you start using the medium, you have to use that throughout the rest of the painting. Okay, so here, here I'm gonna throw in something that's gonna seem unbelievably complicated, but just to make the point, ideally when using medium, each layer of oil paint should have a little more medium than previous layers. At any rate, once you start using medium in an oil painting, you should continue to use it until the painting is finished. When mi okay, and here's another important point. When mixing medium, do it precisely so that you know for sure how fat or lean your medium is. Don't just guess at or eyeball the amounts of each ingredient. Mix the mediums carefully using a measuring cup. The reason for that is if you do it carelessly, then you don't know if one day you're your medium is fatter than the previous day. And so you're not controlling um, you know, that process that you need to maintain if you're going to create a stable, a painting with stable layers of paint. Um, for further reading, so these are two, these are three very good books, um, three, three well-respected books, put it that way, about materials and techniques for oil painting. I, I list this first one, Max Derner, 
um, just because it's well known. I actually don't recommend it in a sense. I, and I put that disclaimer here um, because he's often talking about materials that really aren't that obtainable anymore. Um, and sometimes he's referring to processes that are unnecessarily complex. But if anyone gets really into it, this is a, a well-known book. Um, this one is very good. Mark David Gotts, again, The Painter's Handbook. Um, and then Ralph Meyer, the one I just referred to, The Artist's Handbooks of Materials and Techniques. Um, very good. Uh, both of these I recommend. Mark David Gotts, again, used to run a great um, online forum where you could go online and ask questions about techniques and you would get great answers. He unfortunately died prematurely five or 10 years ago and the forum shut down. Um, it has been replaced actually by a University of Delaware Museum of Art forum. Um, and if anyone's interested, I'll get that link. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it's, a, it's an online forum where you can go on, you, you sign up for free um, and you can go on and ask questions and you get well, good, good informed answers about techniques. Um, okay, so there are various websites and YouTube tutorials. Um, I haven't done a lot of exploration about those, uh, but I will just, just to be thorough about this. So I'll post this on Blackboard. Um, so let me, I'm gonna pull up. Um, everyone, can, everyone can see my browser, right? I get a little bit confused about this. Yes. Okay. So. So a bunch come up. This, um, I'm gonna recommend, uh, well, I, I recommend this with some reservations. I don't know if anybody knows this guy. He does these, um, he does these, uh, his name's Andrew Tischler. He has an extensive, um, very highly produced, the uh, instructional videos on painting. I mean, they're so highly produced, like when he goes from the art supply store back to his home, you know, it's as if it's a filmmaker shot him like on the way home. Um, this is a, a video about um, materials and tech, I mean, about oil painting mediums. Um, so he does have, I will recommend this. This would be my modeling for this section here. I do break this rule. How's it going? Andrew here and welcome to the studio. In this little video, I'm gonna to talk to you about color mixing and share with you exactly what's on my palette. Trying to get there. But I no longer need oh no, the lost part it. of it. Sorry. So instead, I took that off and I've attacked. He has some useful information. Now and again. Okay. But so I don't know how that happened. But so this section of this video, he does a good job talking about the 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 methods you should use when putting oil painting medium down. So fat over lean, thick on thin, flexible on stiff, slow over fast, and. Um, he has these demonstrations of like the layers of the paint. This is pretty good. Um, I recommend this. He, I want to, he recommends at one point, and he says he does this himself. Um, he uses just liquid as a medium. I, I just want to, to say that I discourage people from doing that because liquid, if you just use nothing but liquid, in your paint, it's going to make the paint dry very fast. It's going to make it dry with a kind of glassy, uh, a kind of glassy, sticky looking surface. And I, I just think it's not, I, I think by making oil paint dry so fast, I think you're really running risks. 
So I just want to point out that he recommends or he says he uses just liquid. I wouldn't do it. Um, but there is some good information here. Um, he has some decent information in some of his videos. Um, I, you know, I don't think his paintings are very good. You know, they're technically perfectly fine. Um, hate to say that. Um, but anyway, um, okay, so. Professor? Yeah. It sounds like the best route would be using your combination of the medium. I think so. Okay. But, um, you know, that is my opinion. Now, let me just point out one thing. I do, um, now, Professor, uh -huh. in theory, the, our gray seal egg is almost like an underpainting. In theory, what? Our, the painting, or uh, our assignment, the gray seal egg. Yes, that's, yes. Underpainting. We can go over it with like, let's say creams and browns, you know, with a little bit of red to make it like a warmer, more natural palette. Yes, you could, you could experiment with that. Yes, for sure. Yeah, the, the painting we do, did, right. And I, I think I used the word grisaille without defining it. I, I, I know, I think on, on Blackboard, I, I call this, that's still life, a grisaille egg, G-R-I-S-A-I-L-L-E. Um, grisaille comes from the French word gris, which means gray. And it's a word that's used to describe a, a painting that's made with white and one other color, usually black. Um, so, and, and the traditional underpainting is referred to as a grisaille. So yes, in effect, we did an underpainting and you could do, you could glaze over it for sure. So I do want to point out one thing. So I've been mentioning, um, uh, this medium I'm going to mix up. You could also buy, now I haven't used this but I have a lot of faith in Gamblin's products. Um, and they make this medium Neo McGilp. McGilp is this weird word for a, a traditional oil painting medium. Um, I, I don't know where the word comes from. There's an old fashioned McGilp medium. Um, this, is a, this is a McGilp medium that's made by contemporary processes. I would, I'll try this for future classes. Um, Let me just see something here. And um, I, I could recommend buying this. That way you don't have to mix things up. If anyone is interested in doing that, you know, it's a little pricey. This is a small bottle, four ounces. It costs nine bucks. Um, you know, a, a 16 ounce bottle costs 24 bucks. Uh, you know, that's, we're getting a little pricey. Um, but I, I, I wouldn't hesitate to recommend this if anyone wanted to try it. Like I said, I'm gonna try it. Um, and that's also a, by way of pointing out that you can buy pre-mixed mediums. Um, let's see what they have here, oil mediums. So um, my only problem with them is um, you don't always know what's in them. So you get, I feel like you run a little bit of the risk of not really knowing what's going to happen to your paint surface. So, you know, there's all of these Dale Rowney flow medium, who knows what that means. Schmink rapid medium, that probably means it dries um, faster. That gets, I think that gets a little bit dangerous. Um, Windsor Newton liquid original medium. So this is a version of liquid, but it's, it's made into a, medium. Um, so there are these pre chroma archive oils, lean medium. Huh. So um, lean, so that means there's not a lot of oil in it. A chroma archive oils, fat medium, that's probably that must mean that there's a lot of oil in it. You know, I mean, maybe some of these are perfectly good. I haven't tried. I mean, I haven't tried most of these. I've just always used my pre made medium. So, um, you know, those are just options for people. Um, okay, so let's stop that. And I'm gonna go back to sharing, whoops.
Professor, another question. Yes. When a recipe calls for turpentine, um, can you use or switch turpenoid in there? Uh, not if you are using Damar varnish, um, because turpenoid is, it's, that's just a brand name for a, a kind of mineral spirits. So, and Damar varnish will not dissolve in, in mineral spirits. So for most, for most applications with oil painting, you can use mineral spirits instead of turpentine, except where Damar varnish is involved. Okay, so that would be the only exception. Um, what are you asking? Because you're thinking of trying that traditional medium. No, I was just looking in my supply of, of um, paint stuff and I just found the terpenoid and I was wondering if they were interchangeable. Terpenoid is, terpenoid is a mineral spirit that's similar to Gamsol. A lot of the um, harmful or you know, supposedly harmful things have been removed from it. Um, but Gamsol is even a little bit safer than terpenoid. So, um, Let's see, I don't know if this is going to, okay. So, um, all right, so um, I'm not going to, so I'm not going to um, go through the demonstration of mixing this, but what, what I do, if you're interested in buying these things, what I would recommend doing is um, getting a, a um, measuring cup. Obviously, if you use it for your oil painting stuff, you don't then use it for food, right? If you get a measuring cup to mix your oil paint with you, it's, it, from that point forward, it's used for nothing but these things, right? You don't want to mix containers that you use with oil painting with food. Um, even though linseed oil is nothing but vegetable oil. Um, but this stuff is chemicals. Um, so you want to measure out these ingredients precisely, right? So if I'm going with one to one to three, I might mix one ounce stand oil, one ounce liquid to three ounces mineral spirits um, or something like that. And so you just, you just mix those components um, and you know, put it in another container and then you have this to use. So, um, I'm, I'm very, very careful about percentages and making sure I know exactly what medium I'm using. So I always label my, my jars of medium. So this is four parts mineral spirits, two parts linseed oil, one part liquid. So actually, I, my own medium is a little bit different from the recipe I gave you because I know the kind of medium I want. I want my paint to stay a, stay wet a little bit longer than the recipe I gave you will allow, will allow for. So I, I want my paint to stay workable, wet and workable just a little bit longer. So I have two parts linseed oil and just one part liquid. But you know, that's just my preference. Okay, so let me put these things away. Um, can I clarify anything about the issue with the oil mediums? No, thank you. Okay, so the one last thing I'm gonna do before we get started with the demo today, uh, well actually images and the demo, is I'm gonna remind people how to get your clean mineral spirits out of this container you've already used, right? You don't wanna be throwing away your mineral spirits. Um, I mean, for mainly, I guess mainly, if we're gonna be um, stewards of our environment, I suppose mainly because it's environmentally bad, but really mainly because we want to save ourselves money, 
right? So, um, okay, so I have my container of mineral spirits that I used yesterday, or actually the day before, I wasn't here yesterday. Um, so I want to get my clean mineral spirits out of this, right? So remember, these mineral spirits at the end of my painting session on Sunday were all muddy and dirty, right? Because I've been cleaning my brushes in them all day. And then if you remember what happens is when you use your mineral spirits, um, so look, look at, this is an old jar of mineral spirits, okay? So I'm going to, I, I use this a little bit. So I'm gonna, is that gonna work? Well, sort of. So um, if, if I mix up the, the crud that's down there, um, you're gonna see that become a little bit cloudy and dirty again. What happens is all of that crud, when I leave it overnight, all of that crud settles to the bottom. So, so that muddy, dirty mineral spirits that was in this jar, all of, the, all of those dissolved oil paint has settled to the bottom now, right? It's like mud settling to the bottom of a river. So I'm gonna be able to pour out from the top of this jar into my transfer jar. I'm gonna be able to pour out my clean mineral spirits. So I have a jar full there of clean mineral spirits. I'll put a little bit more into another jar. And then at the bottom of this, um, you can see it, bottom of the jar, there's the, the, the buildup of those little patches of dirty paint. So I'll take my brush and I'll mix all that together. So I'm mixing all that together. So I get this so you can see it. And then I'm dumping that into this sludge jar. And I keep that sludge jar, I just cap it and keep it, um, I put it in a, I store it in my in a cabinet. And then when this is full, I just throw it away. And again, you're allowed to do that in New York City. Um, again, I should say at least the last time I checked, and I have to admit, I think the last time I checked was when I moved back to New York City from grad school in 1999, so maybe things have changed. Um, so now I'm gonna pour out that clean mineral spirits into my um, jar. And so now I have perfectly clean mineral spirits, 100% usable. Um, they look a little bit slightly tinted, um, but I don't, have to, I don't have to go back into my jar of oil of mineral spirits, right? I don't have to use brand new mineral spirits. So I won't do that every day. Um, I won't do it again, but I just wanted to um, show people one last time. By the way, I, um, I always have rolls of toilet paper on my painting table. They're just handy for doing quick cleanups of things. All right. Okay, so um, I'm gonna switch again to um, we'll look at some images. Okay, so um, here's my very bad iPhone 7 photograph of the demo I did last week. Um, so we started the semester 
um, doing this grizz eye painting, right? Um, or this black and white painting where we carefully observed value relationships and tried our best to understand the way light falls on a form. Like what happens to light when it falls on a form? So um, let's try to remember some of the elements of light and shadow. So uh, who can name the, some of the elements of light and shadow falling on this egg? The Terminator? Yeah, the Terminator is that edge between the light, the light mass and the dark mass, right? So um, Riku, what do we call this lighter area within the shadow? Um, reflected the, light? The reflection light? Reflected light, that's right. Um, Jalian, what do we call um, this darker area in the shadow? So I'm asking Jalian. Jalian? Phoebe, what do we call this? Is that like the shadow's edge? Well, this, this is the shadow edge. There's a, we have a, a different term. So the shadow edge is right here. And then like as we move from the shadow edge into the shadow, we get a reflected light, and then this darker band has its own name. I mean, I, I, core shadow? Core shadow. shadow. Isn't it the core shadow, Professor? Core shadow, right. Thanks, Sakina. Yeah, it's the You're welcome. The core of the shadow, or core shadow, sometimes people call it. So we have light mass, dark mass. Um, reflected light, core shadow, the shadow edge, or the terminator. What about um, these slightly, these tones that are sort of between dark and light? Would those be half tones? Half tones, -tones? exactly, yep. The, to the half tones are the tones that transition the shadow into the light or the light into the shadow. I don't know why my, why my, my, the, my camera photographed this. Um, it almost looks like the lights are orangey. I don't know why. It totally didn't look like that before. The, yeah, no, it, it didn't on the, on the film. Yeah, the, it really uh, didn't. iPhone 7 does not have a good camera. <laughs> so I'm very cheap when it comes to technology. Okay, so what do we call, this is called the form shadow. What do we call this shadow here? Shadow accent. The cast the shadow. Occlusion. This is the this entire thing is the cast shadow. Um, so where's who said shadow accents? I did. Isn't that the undertone, like right under it? Yeah. So the shadow accent is the darkest part of um, the shadow accent is the darkest part of the form of the darkest part of the shadow, where essentially there's no light hitting that area. So that's the shadow accent. Um, what what is this here? The highlight. The light. Yep. Uh, the, the, this is the highlight. Um, this light shape is technically called the center light. Okay. Um, so again, I, I'm obviously I'm not going to test you on these terms, but it just as a way of um, you know, so we start to develop and use the same language. Okay, so. We started with this, right? Starting to understand both value perception, um, but also um, the, the elements of light and shadow. So today we're gonna talk about light and shadow as it relates to something, I'm, a term I'm gonna use throughout the semester, planar structure. So um, we can think about, or we, we perceive light and shadow on objects because objects can be understood as being made up of a series of planes. And each of those planes, whether we're talking about the top plane on this cube or the side plane or this plane here, each of those planes that an object is constructed from have a specific relationship to the light source. So in this image here, 
or for that matter in this image, the light's coming from the upper left, right? This the light's coming from the direction of this arrow. And each of these planes of the object, now these are obviously geometric planes that, um, you know, have a, these objects have clearly geometric constructions, right? And each of the planes of these objects have a, a specific relationship to the light source. So, uh, so planes on an object that are more directly facing the light source, like this plane on this object here is pretty much parallel to the plane of the light source, right? The, the, the light, the direction of the light is hitting that plane at a perpendicular angle, right? So this plane is facing the light source. So that's the most strongly illuminated plane. These other planes are turned away from the light source to different degrees. And the more a plane is turned away from a light source, the less light it's receiving. And so the less able we are to perceive the value of that plane. Remember, value means degree of lightness or darkness. So these are paintings of white objects. When the, when the plane on the object is most directly facing the light source, we are most able to perceive the lightness, that light value of the white object. As planes of that object turn away from the light source, we are less and less able to perceive the, va the local value of that plane. Less light is hitting the object, so we're less able to see the value of that plane. So we're going to really try to understand that property um, in today's, um, today's assignment. So using light and shadow, to create the illusion of a three-dimensional a three-dimensional form in space. So, I don't, I don't think I've actually mentioned this too much in the painting class. I talked about this a lot in my drawing class. What we're doing is, as painters in these assignments, is we're trying to make a flat surface appear to be a three-dimensional space opening up in front of the view. Right? So we're trying to convince the viewer that the flat surface they're looking at is not a flat surface at all. That it's a three-dimensional space with three-dimensional volumes in it. And using light and shadow, and using light and shadow with an understanding of planar structure are two fundamental tools we have to create that illusion. That illusion that a flat surface is actually a three-dimensional space opening up before a viewer. And teaching the way light and shadow helps to create the illusion of three-dimensional volumes is often done by, by starting with a very simple understanding and block-in of light and shadow. And we did that in our first assignment, right? Where we started our egg by blocking in a very simple light mass and a very simple dark mass. So this is an image from a 19th century drawing book book on how to draw. Um, and it shows the first step in drawing a, basically a sculpture. Right? So the artist starts with this kind of structural block in of the object using straight lines, a common technique for starting a drawing, um, using straight lines or tight arcs that initially ignore small detail so the artist has started this drawing by looking at the overall angle from one important point on the contour to another important point. The artist has not looked at every little break in the contour, right? That's saved for later. So starting with this large structural drawing and then starting to understand the complexity of the light and shadow by blocking in the very simple masses of light and dark. And notice how the artist has not only started with a simple mass of light and dark, but has understood the light and dark to be falling on planes in relationship to each other. So the planes that are illuminated, that are light, we read as light planes moving in, in space in one specific direction, right? So the planes of this object that are illuminated are moving through space in such a way that they are, they are relatively 
parallel to the light source. So they're receiving full light. And then when that form turns in space, when the form turns so that it's moving in a different direction, that turn causes the form or the planes of the form to have a different relationship to the light. So the form turns away from the light and is no longer receiving light, so it moves into shadow. So we're going to try to understand that basic principle of how to conceive of an object as a series of planes. So here are some examples of, on the, in this, on the left, we see an image from an, an, an anatomy book. It's published in the 90s. It's a pretty good anatomy book, artistic anatomy. It's written for artists um, that has a section on um, planar structure, they say mass conceptions. And they've provided, um, they've provided us with a, a simple planar conceptualization of a human head. And it's simplified and planar so that we can easily understand how to create the illusion of the complex anatomy of a human being, create the illusion of that complex volume moving clearly through space. So we simplify all of those small details into these big planar, planar masses so that we conceive of the human head as having a top plane moving in one direction, a front forehead plane moving in a different direction, the side plane of the head moving in a third direction, and so on. So this is a detail of a painting that is that's owned by the Frick Collection in New York. So you can see it um, anytime you want to go visit the Frick Collection. Um, and it's also in a big show right now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art of portraits from this period. It's a great show, by the way, highly recommend it. Um, it's called, I, it's they ref, it, the Medici Collection, I think it's called. But if you, if you go to the Met website and look up Medici, M-E-D-I-C-I, it's a big show of portraits from this period. Great show, highly, highly recommended. They have some absolute masterpieces from throughout history. Um, this much more complex um, painting by Bronzino, who was a 17th century, 16th century Italian painter. Um, notice how the light and shadow on this head are understood according to this, a very similar or in a very similar way to the planar construction that has been provided for us in this anatomy book, right? So the, the planes, we can read the planes on this young man's head that are illuminated as corresponding to the to simplified planar structure on this head here. And notice where this head turns direction and moves into shadow, actually similar to this sculpture is where this head changes direction and moves into shadow. So we have an unmistakable sense of a volume that has planes moving in one direction. And then at the terminator, the form changes direction and turns away from the light. So we, we no longer see planes illuminated. We see planes in shadow um, and we have, and we therefore are able to create a sense of that volume turning around through a space, right? Because we see light hitting planes in one direction and then here form changes direction and moves backwards in space away from the direction of the light. So that's how a controlled lighting situation like we are using and an, and an understanding of planar structure can help to create that palpable sense of a volume that we are trying to create. Um, what did I want to say about this? Oh, so we can see in this, um, we can see the, this complicated light mass, right? A complicated shadow mass, core of the shadow, reflected light, right? We can see all of those elements of light and shadow, the half tone that transitions that shadow into the light and so on. Um, so in a more complex form, the artist is using those same elements that we've been studying. So this is a very old painting, right? So this painting was made 
let's say 1525, the, the rough date of that. So we're talking about 600 years ago. Do I have my math right? 500 years ago. Yes, about 500 years ago. Uh, this is a painting by a contemporary artist named Kerry James Marshall. Um, this is a painting he made in 1995. Kerry James Marshall is using exactly the same principles. Right? It's a much more contemporary style of painting uh, with a, a much broader range of influences, of cultural influences. Now, Kerry James Marshall famously paints all his figures with black paint right out of the tube. And he does that because he, uh, uh, part of why he does that is he wants to emphasize the way we use language in contemporary culture, particularly the way we use the word black in contemporary culture. So the way we use that term in both positive ways and negative ways. So he always paints his figures using black right out of the tube. Then he mo modulates it. Now I'm going to um, show a slightly, I lightened this image in Photoshop. Notice how Kerry James Marshall, can people see the distinction? I just wanna make sure you can see it on your screen, the distinction between the lighter gray here and the black here? Yes. Yes. So Kerry James Marshall, a contemporary artist is using that exact same way of understanding the construction of a human head. So if we compare the Kerry James Marshall head to this planar construction here, you'll notice that the volumes are understood with, with you know, nearly identical planar conceptualization. So um, this Boy Scout's face is lighter along the front plane of the head and where the head turns direction, it, it goes into shadow, it right? goes into shadow here. Um, and uh, what did I wanna say? K. James Marshall then constructs the volumes of the features by using white paint. He's actually scumbling white paint over the black. So putting a kind of like thin, um, thin layer of the paint over the black underpainting. Um, and Kerry James Marshall is um, uh, on the one hand, very influenced by Renaissance painting, um, very influenced by the kind of structure of Renaissance painting. And um, part of the content of this painting is Kerry James Marshall is insisting on the presence of African-American experience in central mainstream American culture, right? That was part of the emphasis of this series of paintings where he's painting young, adolescent African-Americans portrayed as Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. And part of the content of that painting has to do with a palpable, unmistakable presence of that figure. And so using that traditional structural approach emphasizes that. Right? It emphasizes that unmistakable presence. So I point that out because these techniques and these devices we're using to construct paintings, we sometimes talk about them um, as if it's purely technical. And we're primarily concentrating on technical elements in what we're learning. But all of these technical elements, all of these you know, we can also refer them to them as formal devices. They all ultimately have conceptual and narrative implications, which I think is always important to remember. Um, so just a couple other examples, you know, I just emphasizing that we don't only see the kind of structure um, we're learning in these highly refined paintings. Um, this is a painting by uh, uh, they're at this point very famous American portrait painter named Alice Neal. Um, there happens to be a, a, a great show of her work up at the Metropolitan Museum of Art um, right now. So for anyone who's interested in painting, there are two great shows at the Met right now. There's the Medici show. You're gonna see some stunningly beautiful paintings. And there's an Al a show of Alice Neal's work. Highly recommend both. So Alice Neal is a much uh, a painter who works in what we might call a more expressionist style. You know, she's interested in a, a much more physical, rapid, um, 
we, we sometimes say gestural way of painting. Um, but in Alice Neal's work, similar to what I mentioned about um, Carrie James Marshall's work, her, she's very interested in the presence of the human being. So she always wants to create an unmistakable sense of being in the presence of an actual real human being. I'm not realistic in the sense that we use that word, you know, like in that kind of simplistic way where we think a painting that looks like a photograph is somehow realistic. I would, I would argue that it's not realistic at all, a photorealist painting. Um, but it's realism in the sense that she always wants us to have the feeling that we're very much in the presence of an actual human being. And we can start to read into the figure, like the narrative, of that person, you know, some, there's some evidence of the life of that person. Um, and part of doing that is again, making an unmistakable sense of a palpable, three-dimensional figure in space. So notice the way she constructs this arm. Notice where that highlight is placed, clearly demarcating a point on the form where there's a change in direction from the side plane of the arm to the top plane. And then where the arm goes into the shadow, it drops into space, right? It turns into a shadow plane. Notice the you know, kind of expressive um, gestural marks up here, but what do those marks eventually create? A highlight plane moving in one direction. And then right here, we change directions and move to the front plane of the forehead and then where the terminator is, we drop into shadow, right? Alice Neal using light and shadow in exactly the same way. We are this complex terminator moving down the head, moving down the neck, around the shoulder, around the arm, and so on. Um, so the elements of the properties of planar um, painting that we're going to be emphasizing today are ver I don't want to say virtually always, but frequently an, an aspect of much of the painting we look at, certainly much of the figurative painting we look at. This is an old um, sketchbook drawing by a famous German artist named Albrecht Dürer. Um, it's, this is from the 16th century. Um, so Dürer here, figuring out how to understand the planar structure of the human head. Let's compare this to a 19th century painting by Thomas Aikens, a painting of a man playing a cello. And notice the way Aikens has painted the head. He's paint, it's a naturalistic painting, right? We look at this and we believe that we're looking at a naturalistic figure, but look how the light's falling on that head. Notice how clearly Thomas Aikens has interpreted the head as a series of planes. Uh, the side plane of the head moving backwards in space this way. And then just like in, before we get to the front plane of the forehead, just like in this um, Albrecht Dürer planar drawing, the shadow plane changes direction and we have a transitional halftone plane. We have this transitional halftone plane here before we get to the front plane of the forehead. So we have a very clear sense of this volume turning through the space, right? A plane moving in one direction, we change direction, we change direction again. So we're gonna be analyzing a simple object, a piece of fruit, um, and trying to understand it in terms of the planar structure so we can use that planar structure um, so that we can best understand how to use light and shadow to create a palpable sense of volume. Um, this is a, a painting a student did. Um, it looks like they picked up the painting before it was dry and left a fingerprint. I've never noticed that. Um, this is a painting they did. This is a famous, a kind of famous teaching tool. This is a, a plaster cast of um, the mouth from Michelangelo's David. Um, and um, this is a, a, a grisaille study that this student did, a planar study of this mouth. So they interpreted 
the volumes of the mouth as a series of planes so that, the, that we could really understand how those planes turn through space. And that's what we're gonna be doing today, okay? So I'm going to, again, switch share. Um, Professor, I have a quick question. Sure. Um, maybe this is, I don't know, maybe there's no answer to this yet, but like, what about when you're looking at like facial hair? Like, how would you plane that out? Cause it's kind of like, I mean, at least with the beard question, picture, it looked kind of like confusing as to where the shadows would be like going and like the texture. Well, okay, so are you, what, I, I've lost track of what you're all looking at. Are you still looking at the slideshow? Um, it was actually the one that you were showing, I forget the name, but it was, you're looking at the plan, the plan, is it planner structure? And it was like the light on one side of the face and it was the guy with the beard right after the sketch. But what are you, but what do you, what do you see on the screen right now? Do you see the- Oh, right now I see your workspace. Okay, so let me just change. Can you see the slideshow now? Yeah, it's that one right there. Yeah, like with in regards to like the beard, how would you like kind of figure out the direction of shadows? Because like yeah. to me, it's just not as clear as like the face. Um, yeah, I'll show you know. show you a few images. So um, okay, so well, so look at where is the head illuminated here? So. Notice how the light, let's, let's go for a second. Let's go to this, um, we'll look at this image here. So notice how the shift in the, in the plane, um, there's this characteristic shift, right? So we have the shift um, along the, the four, the, this is a certain anatomical feature called the parietal line or the parietal arch and um, that's where the plane changes direction, right? And notice how the parietal arch continues up along the division between the top plane of the, of the skull and the side plane. Do you see that? So if we go back to this, notice how the light, the light shifts along that division. We have a series of highlights that are falling, that are happening at the division between the top plane and the side plane. Do you see that? Yeah, I see that. And then, uh, yeah, I see it. Uh -huh. And then notice how, I mean, this is a kind of broad painting. So notice how the artist has, so this part of the head, this part of the hair is along the side plane of the head, which is illuminated, right? And then where the, where the, where the overall hair, not individual strands, but the overall form that the hair makes, changes direction and turns towards the side of the head. It goes into a little bit of shadow there. Do you see that? Yeah. So the artist is still seeing <laughs> the hair as a series of planes. Um, now in, you know, it's a little bit, it's true, it's a little bit more complicated with Alice Neal's, but still um, the hair on this side of the head, she's seeing a, really a series of planes, right? That little bit of light, that little bit of lighter, value is facing the light and then where the overall hair changes direction it turns away from the light then it turns back to the light there do you see what i mean he has a comb over you know in the top plane of that comb over um, is illuminated and then there's a little ledge of that comb over where it's turned away from the light goes into shadow there do you see what i mean yeah i think it's probably like there's like sections but then i guess they add like texture for individual strands on top is that Correct. Yeah, exactly. So it's a little bit more complicated here, but still, um, you know, like he's Bronzino's Bronzino. It does go in in this painting with a little brush and make little strands, um, unlike the previous two artists. But notice, notice this this cluster of hair here. That you know, that's where it's facing the light. It's illuminated, and then as it starts to roll away from the light, it goes into shadow. Do you see that? It has these little highlights here. Um, so that he's still, he's dealing with hair in a more complicated way, but he's still dealing with it by observing how those um, tufts of hair respond to the light. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think tufts make sense, sense to me, yeah. So, and, and look at this photo here of this model. Um, the light's coming from above and the left. And notice the top planes of the hair the top plane of the hair is illuminated 
the front planes that are turned away from the light are in shadow. Um, and then, you know, then each on that overall top plane that's illuminated, there are strands, individual strands and individual clusters that are more strongly illuminated. But it, it follows the same property. I mean, it, it follows the same principles, sorry. Um, okay. Um, does that help? Yeah, it helps a lot. And I think maybe even just taking images and like changing the contrast would help a lot by like just looking at like high contrast hair images, kind of like that picture. But yeah, it makes a lot more sense now. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm gonna. Professor, I have a quick question. Go ahead. Do you ever sketch your painting first before you apply the paint? Well, that like cheating? yeah, personally, I do. Um, I, I like, like, should I have sketched the egg and then painted it? You think it would have came out better? You mean drawn, sketched it with a pencil or something? With like a that? pencil, right. You can do that. Um, I do. You can do that if you're more comfortable with that. Um, I think in these, I think it's not a bad idea to get used to drawing with a brush. Um, brush, okay. A lot of artists do that exclusively. I mean, I do, when I do my own work, I do a drawing first, and then I, tr I do a drawing on paper first, and then I transfer that drawing to the panel I'm working on. So um, I, I use a different process than I show you in class just because I, you know, there wouldn't be much point in me going through the whole process. Um, Is but, there a paintbrush that acts like a, a pencil? <laughs> well, I mean, I, yes. I mean, the short answer is yes, but I think it's better to uh, use the kind of brush I do the demonstration with. I'll show you why. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Well, you know, that, again, that, that's a sort of preference issue. So you'll develop your own preference. Okay, so let me. Yeah, I just need to figure out where is the best way to put this. Uh, Professor, I, I noticed that in majority of the paintings that you've done with us, there's like a a, a, a divider. Do you uh, have to have a divider? You noticed what? A divider, like the table from the wall. You, you, you know how you did the A? The yeah. top was lighter than the table. But... I didn't do it that way because I, it, it sat in the box. The egg is lighter than the table? No, no, no. You see how you separated, uh, your egg was separated. It had a line across, it was from the, like it was sitting on a table. Yeah. A line coming across. Um, were we supposed to do it that way? No. Or? No, just, I mean, I put that there you because- that it was happened. like a spacey like thing, so I didn't, I didn't do it. No, just paint, you know, paint what you see around the object. Oh. Okay. You, so you mean this line right here? Is that what you mean, Michelle? Excuse me? You the mean- The line that's, you know- The line right here? You see your pepper? Yeah. Okay. See where the board meets up with the wall? Yeah. You had that how your egg was. I I didn't I didn't do that because my it sat in a box. So Yeah, that's fine. If you don't see background it, behind it, I just yeah. let it illuminate in the wall. If you don't see that division, that's fine. It doesn't matter. Can I imagine it and just put it there if I want to? Or sure. Sure. Okay. All right. Okay, so, um, all right, let me, um, before I get into this, let me just, 
I want to just a little bit more. You move it over the other way, Professor. Yeah, I, I want to emphasize something else. Just this oh, time. okay. Okay, so just for uh, we've sort of gone over this with images, but just for clarity. So when I um, just so it's absolutely clear. So when I say a plane, when I talk about planar structure and refer to planes, what I'm talking about is just a flat surface, right? So this is a plane, right? It's a, a, a flat two-dimensional surface. Um, and sometimes a plane in painting may be like slightly bent. We may talk about planes that are slightly bent. So that's a plane, right? That's all I mean. We're gonna be talking about how objects are constructed of a series of planes. So this is um, an object that's, that has three planes, right? Um, and again, just so that we're absolute, I'm absolutely clear, this plane is parallel to the light source, right? That plane is facing the light source. So we can see with clarity, the local value of this plane. The local value meaning the value that the object has when it's under optimum light. So we're seeing this as light. As planes turn away from the light source, we lose the ability to, re to see the, the fullness of the value. And so this, this plane is turned away from the light source, so it gets a little bit darker. This plane is completely turned away from the light source, so it's in shadow. It's getting reflected light, but it's in shadow, right? So we, we're looking at a white object, but we're only seeing white here. Here we're seeing a light gray, here we're seeing a dark gray, right? And we can turn this object so that the plane, this plane here is essentially the same value as that plane there, right? So there's no difference between this value and that value because this plane is turned away from the light source. Okay, so we're going to be looking very carefully at geometric, uh, an organic object and trying to understand how we're seeing different values on that object depending on the relationship of the specific plane on the object to the light source. So we could take this, so we've gone from a, a plane to an object made up of, of, of three planes. So now we have three different values. And then we can take a, an object that's constructed of multiple planes. And now we see a whole range of values, right? From white to a sequence of grays um, until we turn almost completely away from the light source. Right? So different, different values on an object are perceived because the planes of that object have different relationships to the light source. The more a plane on an object is facing a light source, the lighter it's gonna be. The more it's turned away, the darker it's gonna be. And we want to start being able to understand light and shadow on objects in terms of planar structure. We don't wanna think about light and shadow on an object just in terms of a gradation of value, because you run the risk of creating a painting where that is rendered from light to shadow, but somehow seems flat. So you always want to understand light and shadow as a specific relationship of an object to the light source, or a specific relationship of the planes of an object to, to the light source.
So I have a, um, I have a pepper. Okay, so um, we have our same situation, same setup. Um, okay, so to answer the question about um, a brush that's similar to a pencil, um, you know, you can get. Hold, give me one second. I don't. I don't think I have a very good. these kinds of brushes anymore, so I don't have a very good um, example of one. I do have this um, brush. It's a, a number one. Th these brushes are referred to as number one round. So it's a type of brush called a round. Um, and you can get, um, you know, you might try a number one round. I have a, um, a smaller version of that in very bad shape. Um, that's, that's, I think, a zero. Oh, that's a two, number two. Oh. Different sizes. Different so you can get a brush like that. And you know, I, I think some people consider these to be somewhat like a pencil. Um, Did you say that was a zero or a two? No, this number is number one round. The smaller one is actually a number two. Uh, two. But um, that surprises me because it's smaller than the number one. But I, sometimes different brand names have slightly different numberings. I see. They should be, they should be uh, more standard. Um, so you want to get, you want to look for a bristle brush, uh, number one round or number zero round. Um, I mean, I don't like. I'll, I'll start. I'll do part of the drawing with this. I don't. I don't like this to draw with. I'd rather draw with a brush that has this shape, a kind of chisel mm. brush. Mm -hmm. um, I just think it's, it's better. I think they're more useful for drawing, but I, I'll, sh I'll show both ways. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay, so. All right, so. Um, for today's painting, we're again going to be using um, white and Payne's gray. So we're not using color. This 
This, by the way, is common with oil paint. It doesn't mean you have a bad batch. Um, there's some separation sometimes between the oil and the pigment. Okay, so, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to try to understand this object. We're, we're going to try to understand and find an under, what I would call an underlying planar structure, okay? So we're going to try to see the planes on that object. So the first, you know, first we can eat relatively easily see a, the overall light plane and the shadow plane, right? The, the object goes in the shadow. It has a, a pretty clear light, light plane and a shadow plane similar to this cube. Right, the, the plane on this cube that's facing the light source is illuminated. The plane that's turned away from the light source is in shadow, right? Um, so that's, that's the, I mean, that we, we can clearly see that. Professor, we're using a piece of fruit, right? Not an object. Yeah, use, a, some, use an organic, something organic. So like a, a pepper is a good thing to use. Orange? Yeah, an orange is good. Um, okay. Uh, an orange, a lemon, um, uh, a um, pomegranate would be good. Kiwi? Do, uh, don't use a banana. A banana, it's too, there's something too simple about the planes on a banana. Is kiwi fun? I'm sorry? Kiwi. It's a piece of fruit. Kiwi, I think, is a little bit too um, simple. It's a little bit too egg-like. I would use something that has a little bit more structure. OK. A pear? Apple. Yes? A pear? A pear would be great, yeah. Apple? Apple, yeah, but only if you have nothing else. Orange, lemon, pear, pomegranate, pepper would be better. OK. So, um, okay, I'm gonna start, I'll start the drawing on this. Um, and I'm going to start drawing this um, in a way similar, if people remember the drawing I showed of the sculpture in the slides a few minutes ago. I'm gonna start this drawing um, with a, by blocking in a, ser a simple series of straight lines. So I'm not going to start the drawing by um, looking at all the little curves and bumps and hollows on that um, contour. I'm gonna think about this in a more structural way so that I can really start to use my lines in a way that carves out um, the planar structure that we're looking for. So what do I mean by that? So, I'm not just copying every little bump and hollow. I'm starting my drawing by looking at key points on the contour. So what I call high points on the contour. So I'm looking at this high point compared to this high point here, then to this corner, then to this front corner. And notice that, notice the bottom of the pepper. Notice how we could see the bottom line of the pepper as a line that's clearly moving backwards in space in perspective. And so I want to, um, I want to give a sense of that um, structural aspect of the contour. I don't want to just draw this in that kind of naive way where I just copy that shape. Instead, I'm trying to, to build, build this structure by seeing, by, by seeing a series of, of straight lines and a series of points on that contour in relationship to each other. And then by doing that, I can start comparing something that's very important about a contour. So I can start comparing 
these key points, these sort of high points on the contour in relationship to each other. So I want to compare that point. I want to, I want, I, I want to ask myself, what's the angle relationship between this point here and this point here? I want to get that angle relationship accurate. So I'm, I'm going to help myself in doing that if I start with a series of straight lines instead of just tracing around that contour. I have a question. What? Are you defining the plane by the, um, the shapes that you're seeing on or, or the forms that is being that it that is on the pepper or by the light source, the the, the different values. Well, we're, I'm going to de define the planes within the pepper by different values. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Now I know I, I know a, a resistance people sometimes have to um, drawing this way is it looks terribly geometric, right? That doesn't do justice to the organic features of that object. But we're gonna be able to go very easily from this structuring out of the shape to the organic feel of the object. It's very easy to go from this to that. Um, and in fact, you, you can go from this to a much, ultimately a much more convincing depiction of the, the organic structure than if you just start by trying to get those organic curves right away. So I started with a simplification, a, a kind of structural simplification of that shape. Now, again, I want to emphasize something important. We want this to read as, in making a, a, a representation or convincing representation of painting, we can, we want to make the viewer believe that this flat surface, which has two dimensions, right? It has height and it has width. We want the viewer to believe that this flat surface is a space that's moving around like this. Right. We want them to believe that we can move through that space. And if I try to start that drawing by just copying that shape, now I'm exaggerating a little bit, but what I end up with is a flat shape. It's like a, it's like a sticker, right? Like the stickers that little kids love. It's like I got a sheet of stickers of fruits and that's what I have. I don't have something that's believable as starting to carve through the space that I'm trying to create. But if I start my drawing with this kind of analytical structural approach, I can find things like the way the bottom of that fruit cuts through the space, right? The bottom contour of that pepper, one side of it moves backwards in space in one direction, the other side of it moves backwards in space in a different direction. And I can start to see that aspect of the object I'm drawing, right? This object is moving through space like that. This point is closer to us. These points are further away. And I can immediately establish that aspect of the object. Um, so I'm, I'm trying, I'm, I'm looking at this object, taking a structural approach to the drawing. Now I'm going to immediately, I have my contour, and I'm going to immediately use the terminator. So the shadow edge here, right? So where's the shadow edge? The shadow edge. I'm gonna use that terminator to help me create the structural block. So I have my contour, and then I'm going to start carving in the terminator. So what does that terminator do? From my point of view, it starts at the bottom of the object and it sort of cuts up through the middle and then about halfway at the object, the slight turns slightly to the right. 
and maintaining this planar approach. Comes up like that, right? That's my terminator. So I, I've, I've interpreted the terminator also in a planar structural way. And then what happens at the top? We get, a, we get the, the light shadow rolling around some bumps. Let's simplify that at first just into that top backward moving line of that shadow pattern for now. We're just gonna turn, we're just gonna simplify it into that. So with the top of the terminator and then that shadow cuts across like this. So uh, we have, we've started our drawing of this object by create, by pretty convincingly, even in, in a very simple way, creating a side, a a side plane facing the light, a shadow plane turned away from the light, the top edge of this terminator, that edge there, uh, is starting to convincingly move backwards in space that way. Right, so we're trying to convincingly construct a volume. Now this object has a very definite top plane. Right, so that object has a, it's almost like a table-like plane on top that something can rest on, right? So um, I don't have enough space to put it there, but it, something can also rest on it moving backwards and backwards towards the back wall. So I want to, um, I don't want to get bogged down in little details. I want to look for and find that top plane. So starting, from, from the terminator, the top corner of that terminator. I'm gonna look, I'm gonna follow across the top plane or the, or the front edge, I'm gonna find the front edge of that top plane. And start to bring in the specifics of this object. In such a way that I'm, I'm, I'm starting to indicate specific features, but at the same time, clearly creating a planar structure. Hopefully that makes sense when I say that. Professor, quick question. When you go back over your line and refine it, are you using just the dry brush or using a little oh, mineral? I, I put a little mineral spirit. In. Yeah. Yeah. I put a little mineral spirit. Because I was like that. He just did a Houdini. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I just dip it in. So I get it a little bit wet. And then, you know, that just lets me carve back. And... So that's a wet brush. You know, you can, you can, it can get a little bit too wet. Otherwise, you're just using the color straight from the tube. I'm thinning it with a little bit of, of my medium. Got it. Okay, so my, from my point of view, and I think as you see it on the camera, it, my, I have too much space here. So I'm going to bring this, the top line down a little bit. So now again, I've, I've deliberately started this drawing in a way that I'm seeing, I, I want to see side plane, side plane, top plane. And I, I'm doing that because I want to get a sense of this thing 
rolling around in space, both around and you know up and over. So I'm, the, before I do anything else, I'm drawing those planes, those major planes on the object. So and again, above all, I'm trying to create a convincing sense of a three-dimensional volume. I want to do that. It's so now. Sorry, sir. Go ahead. No, go ahead. You're okay. So let's look, now let's look within the object. Let's look very carefully at not just the subtle, soft changes in value as we go from the highlight to the center light yellow or the shift from the center light yellow here to the half tone here. You know, like we could interpret that as soft, gentle transitions, right? We, 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 can, we can see the shift from the center light yellow here to the relatively darker and cooler half tone there. But let's try instead to find, to use those shifts to see a series of planes that help us understand the volume as a planar structure. So I see a transitioning from the shadow plane to the light plane. I see a kind of third transitional plane. You know, in a way similar to what happens on this object. Dark, light, transitional. I see a, a kind of complex transitional plane, irregular transitional plane, running down a kind of rough center plane of that object. It's narrower and then pretty much disappears here. Do people see what I'm looking at right here? Yes. Yes. I was just about to say that. Yeah. And cooler. And then we get, so this plane is slightly darker and cooler and then the, and then the form changes direction. And we get an illuminated center light plane there. And this, this edge between um, this plane and this plane is the highlight. Do people see that? Okay, so now what do I start seeing? What, what's the planar structure in here? I'm again looking, I'm trying to find the planar structure. So I see. Professor, when you say planar structure, are you talking about that has minimal light, but not shadow? Am I talking about what? So when you say planar structure, you're talking like it doesn't have a lot of light, but it's not specifically shadowed. Well, the planar structure, we, we can see the planar structure because of the way the light falls on the object. So the plane, like we're seeing one large shadow plane. That's part of the planar structure. We're I see. We're seeing one large light plane. That's part of the planar structure. But then within the light plane, we're seeing different values of light and half tone. And okay. the differences between light and half tone are also created by the planar structure. Does that make sense? Definitely, yes. Thank you so much. So, okay, so just continuing with that. So then as this pepper moves from side plane and it starts to round out to the top, I see again more. I 
can start to break this down further into planes. So I see a kind of curving plane here. And then I'm seeing, I'm seeing a division between center light and half tone right here. And that's creating a kind of long, almost rib-like or sort of spine-like shift in the plane. So I, this is a rag. You do that so well. Uh, I want to do it like that. Uh, did you have trouble doing that? God, when I do it, it's a smudge. I'm like, ah, I said too much. You know, it might be, I mean, part of the reason I think it wipes off more easily on this panel is because I put that extra layer of gesso on. Mm, okay, okay. So now, um, on, so I'm looking here, I'm looking at that half tone and how that half tone relates to the lights around it. And I'm seeing a shift in plane from a, a plane that's facing the light source to planes that are slightly turned away from the light source. So I'm seeing vision like this. So um, don't hesitate to ask for clarification if what I'm doing is not clear. I'm just, I'm just seeing those shifts in light and shadow as being the result of planes in slightly different relationships to each other. And, I, and on this painting, I do want people to very, very carefully, very carefully try to see the object as, as constructed of planes like this. It's almost like facets on a jewel. Yeah, it's like facets. A filter takes a block down. Yes, it's, it's like facets on an object. That's exactly right. Okay. So to create yeah, all of I them is very necessary. I'm happy to ask. I'm sorry? To create them is, is, is extremely necessary before painting them in, right?
Well, I suppose you could just, you mean to draw them like this is necessary? Correct. Well, I mean, it's, I don't know, actually, now that you mentioned it, I don't know that it's necessary. I mean, it's, it's helpful for me in figuring it out. And I, I guess I was thinking that it's helpful in explaining it to um, you all, but I, but I suppose you could do it by just painting them in if you prefer to work that way. No, this helps me, thank you. It's almost like creating a paint by numbers sort of situation for yourself. I you know, you was gonna start. say that. Yeah, yes, I suppose that's true. The only, sometimes paint by numbers though are very flat and pattern-like. So you wanna make sure that you're dealing with um, like clear depiction of planes, if that makes sense. And this, you know, to some extent, this gets a, a, a little bit interpreted, although I think that, I do think that, um, Well, it's helpful because right away the flat board is starting to look 3D. Feels yeah. like it's coming yeah. up towards you. Yeah, it's a helpful way of starting to see the three dimensions of the object. Now I can put in um, the stem. I'll put the stem in, I think, after I block in some of this paint. Um, I actually, I should have measured the width to the height when I first started. They're taking that measurement. And compared it to the height. Um, but I, I'm not, I think my, I think my pepper is a little bit too wide. Maybe not. Oh no, it's not. I thought it was. Okay. So um, now, okay, so I want to, uh, I'm gonna very broadly lock in uh, the background. So, we, we, we should be painting the back. We're gonna be painting the background just like we did in the first painting. So a middle, we put it in as a. Um, I have a, a question. I thought for this project, we were um, splitting it in half, doing the lines and then making another one and making that one more full. I, is that what it says on the instructions? I think so. Cause I remember seeing it like split in half and have like two planes 
I, I did used to do that, um, but I, I kind of decided that there's not really much point in me making people do that. So I'm just going to ask you to just do one painting of the planar structure. Okay. okay. After giving that assignment for two semesters, I asked myself why I, why I was really making you do that. Sorry for the outside noise. I know my I know my videos are not very slick, like those YouTube ones. But so just I'm I'm doing this fast and I don't want to. But I'm doing the same thing, looking at the values, comparing the values. And so um, just again, as I said last week, I, I, when, when we're working on campus, I always insist people start with the background because um, I think it helps you see value relationships more easily when you first put in the big values around the object. Um, and obviously you're, you're all gonna be working on this on your own so I obviously can't insist on this, but I highly recommend you block in the backgrounds first. Again, because it just helps you see the values around the object. Um, are you thinning out the background with your medium solution or with just the mineral spirits? No, I'm using a little bit of medium. Of medium? Yes. Okay. So, Professor, you mostly use your mineral spirits to like erase. Is that correct? My mostly mineral spirits to what? To to like eliminate, to like erase. Yes, to erase, I use mineral spirits. Thank you. And it depends on the size brush, right, Mr. Uh, Professor? That's a what, a size what? This is an eight. So I, I always use a large brush. Okay. Block in the background. I mean, you could easily get a, you know, you could easily use like that size brush. Okay. If you have it. So I, I should have put something down here so that these that th this was darker than this or this was darker than this. I, I simply forgot today. Um, but because the light is hitting those two planes in slightly different ways, the, the shelf top is slightly darker. So this is slightly darker.
Professor, will you be doing two casts or just one cast? Will I be doing what? You have a double cast. You have one that's on the bottom and then you have one on the back of, of, of your- uh, Oh, the cast shadows? Yes. It's uh, like they, they fall into each other. Oh, you just, will you just be working with just that one or two? Just cast shadows. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. I, if you see that, if you see a cast shadow like that, I would paint it. Okay. Only because it, you know, you might as well, you know, that's its own, whoops. That's going to be its own challenge. So yeah, I'll paint that. Right, I didn't do it. Um, I was just sort of going so fast, I sort of didn't notice. But, um, I, but now that you mention it, I will put that in. So as you can see, I'm not being that careful about painting up to the edge of my drawing. You don't have to be, you know, if you, if you paint up to the edge of the drawing rapidly and then you lose a little bit of the drawing that you have there, you can always get that drawing back. So I'm not being overly careful about maintaining my contours. Or am I too careful about maintaining this contour? I can always reestablish that contour if I lose it a little bit. So um, now, now actually, I'm, I'm glad. Was it you, Michelle, who pointed out this cast shadow or asked about that? Who asked about the cast shadow? Yes, I did. Yeah. So I that was a bit of an oversight for me. I should have painted in that shape of cast shadow before putting down the light for the background. Um, so I I'm gonna paint cash out on the tabletop. And I, I, I'm pointing that out because you always want to paint the lights and shadows as separate areas. You don't want to paint them, you don't want to put down like the light color of the tabletop or the background and then paint the cast shadow into it. Which okay. doesn't mean that you can never paint wet on wet. You can do that. But if but painting the cast shadow and I'm painting down a light mass first and then trying to paint a shadow into it becomes very tricky because the light mass is going to continuously make the shadow mass light. So you always want to paint the shadow masses and the light masses as separate areas. I'm again going to ignore this edge just because I don't want to add too much complication to that. So I'm going to imagine this as if it's a continuous shelf out here. So I'm just looking at the direction of that cast shadow and imagining that continuing out. And now I'm thinking about where 
it would intersect with that shadow on the wall. And the shadow on the wall, which as you can see, I'm painting wet into wet. Something like that. And then, and then as that moves further and further away from the object, it softens. So I'm just finessing that paint together and start to approximate that cast shadow. Just considering that a kind of block in, I can refine that later. Okay, so, um, you know, we're actually supposed to have a break in the middle of class. Um, I, let's just have, I, 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 I want to take a break, step away from painting for a few minutes. Let's take a short break. 
Um, normally we should actually have a 15 or 20 minute break given the length of this class. Um, but because I got started on the demo a little bit late, let's, let's cut it a little bit short, but let's take, let's take a 10 minute break. Okay, we'll start again at um, 11.55, okay? Okay, thanks. Thank you. All right. Hi all, okay. Um, if, um, if people, uh, I'm, I, since I'm turned towards the canvas, I may not see if someone's trying to get in um, after the break. If anybody sees somebody trying to get in and I don't notice, please um, just let me know. Sure. Okay, so um, now we're now we're going to start. We have this. We have our pepper drawn out as a planar structure. So now I'm going to start using those planes and the values of those planes to start constructing a, a planar painting. So using, well, on the one hand, using the same approach as we did with the A in terms of comparing values, I'm gonna first block in that overall um, shadow mass. And I'm going to just block that in as one um, unmodulated plane. So, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm deciding on a value based on the need to make the value of this shadow plane darker than the value of the wall, right? If we look at the value of the shadow plane, that's darker than the wall. So that's how I'm gauging the value I'm gonna be using here. Maybe a little dark, but I think that's okay. So again, I'm just going to block in that shadow plane very broadly, keeping with our approach, our structural plane of approach. Professor, so the pepper doesn't have to be yellow? No, this is a grisaille. We're just using we're just using white and black for this. Okay. So we're just looking at value. We're not looking at color yet. We'll, we'll slowly get to color.
So I'm just going to use the shadow accent down here. Or the occlusion shadow. So just clarify some of the drawing. To start, you, I'm going to start in, in a sense chipping out or using those different values on the planes I'm observing to start constructing start constructing the volume. So we go in. So we, I have the value of the shadow mass. And I'm going to sort of start chipping in these other values of, of, of these planes. Again, looking at how the values change. Depending on the plane and its relationship to the light source. So I'm going, to put on a, I'm going to put in some of the lighter planes. Doesn't it seem like your, doesn't it seem like the, maybe this is just on my computer, has there, Somehow, have you lost some of the detail on the light side of the um, pepper? A little bit. The light. It goes in and out, but I think it's because of the natural light. 
Yeah, yeah and, and the computer. I, I think sometimes it gets overexposed too when yeah, you have the computer. The computer. Yeah. Oh, I see. Reason, yeah. I, I apologize for that. Again, I wish I had better technology. Um, you said, when, when you're when you do the recording, though, I don't think it'll be a problem. It didn't seem like it was before. Okay. All right. So um, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to a little bit take my word for some of these things. Then, so I, I'm going to be I, I want to block in the lighter planes just so I can have that value as a guide. So the 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 planes that are facing the light source, so the planes on the furthest left of the pepper. As you can see, our very bright, right? And so they're clearly much lighter than the background. So as, as the plane shifts from here to the slightly underturning plane along the bottom left-hand part of the pepper, that plane gets just a little bit darker. Maybe I've made it just a little bit too dark. But there's a shift in value. And then we have this half tone, right? As the uh, subtle half tone on the light side of the form. A little change in direction of the plane. It doesn't go into shadow, it goes into a half. So you want that to be a value that's not as dark as the shadow. As the right side of the pepper rolls under towards the surface it's sitting on, that plane gets a little bit lighter, I mean a little bit darker. This long plane here stays roughly the same value. It's not a major shift in that, in that value. So that stays pretty much the same.
I'm just um, just merging the values of the planes together a bit to get rid of some of our lines underneath. There's some of our line lines. And this is where the medium come in, yes? I'm sorry? This is where you're using the medium to, to, to merge? You use a medium on um, the black to... Well, there's a little bit of medium in the paint, but I'm actually just draw, drawing the brush over that edge. I'm not okay. really using extra medium there. Okay. I'll start now to deal with the top of the pepper. So I'm see seeing a, a kind of series of, you know, it's almost like miniature hills and valleys on top of the pepper. You know, as these lumps on the top of the pepper overlap one, in, one another. It's like a series of, again, mi sort of miniature hills. And I'm gonna think about, you know, as that as each individual hill rolls under, it goes into the shadow. So I, I have a slightly different viewpoint than you do. So you're not, you're not in your in the camera, you're not quite seeing exactly what I'm seeing. So on the top right, we're getting these hilltops facing the light.
So let's deal with some of the planar changes in there. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the plane of the core of the shadow. And the core of the shadow is really a plane. It's a kind of long, usually a long, narrow plane. That uh, again is a plane, plane within the shadow. It's within the shadow, so it's not facing the light surface, but it's also not facing any, any reflected surfaces. And now I see some slightly, very subtly. So I either see a darker part of the shadow or I see lighter. Um, I'm trying to decide if I'm gonna make that by darkening or lightening. I think I'm gonna make that those planes within the shadows by darkening, not light. I don't think I need some light. So those kinds of ridges that characterize the form of a pepper, think of those as subtle planes within, within the dark side of the form. It's a little bit overstated, but that's okay. I think for this kind of painting, that's okay.
So um, I'm going to, I'm gonna sort of block, just rough in the um, stem. And um, I'm going to use, because I have so much wet paint up here, I'm gonna use some um, straight Payne's gray right out of the tube because it's going to mix with the paint that's there. And it's going to, um, It's going to light. But I'm also going to treat this. Um, with just a kind of you know, structural planar way. watch and look at how that changes direction. And there's a very definite, um, you know, that's not a soft curve, like a wet noodle, you know, there's a definite plane like movement to this thing. as it turns around. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to treat this, treat this no different from the pepper. So I'm going to look for planes of light and planes of shadow. Matt.
I think earlier you all could see the highlights on the template. Um, I don't know why, still can't figure why that's wrong. There's a highlight here. There's a highlight here. You can start adding those highlights. I think your natural light is changing. There was also an amazing um, cast shadow on the table surface. It's really cool. There was a cast shadow that's now gone. No, it's still there, like a bright yellow spot on the top of a little gray platform. I think your daylight is changing. Yes, yeah, sitting right in the front. The daylight shouldn't be changing because this is north light. I mean, unless it's getting a little, unless the resolution of the camera gets a little bit different with, um, like it's a little bit more, um, so I'm actually using, uh, I have a window light, but I'm using a, uh, an electric light. I, but I don't know, it's a mystery. Oh, wow, that made a big difference, yeah. And treating the, the highlights as the little planes. So just adding smaller planes now that I see in here. Again, really trying to see this object's in a series of faceted planes. So try to identify all of those little shifts in value as, as planes in different relationships to one another. I'm sorry, can you all just excuse me for one second? I just wanna make sure this is not some kind of emergency. Give me one second, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Let me just pause this for one second. Okay, so, um, you know, at this point, really, I would just uh, maybe do a little bit more refining, um, maybe um, so barely soften some of the edges, although really it wouldn't be necessary um, in terms of what you, what you want to hand in. You know, I may go in and soften some of these edges slightly.
you know, something like that. So, um, but again, um, you know, it really at this point, it's just an issue of refining slightly. So this is, this is the basic approach. I'd like people to, again, take a simple, uh, a, take an organic object, ideally a piece of fruit like this, a fruit or a vegetable, um, a pepper, an orange, a lemon, uh, a grapefruit, I suppose, um, pomegranate would work well, a pear would work well. There's especially certain kinds of pears um, are ideal. They have a, a particular kind of planar structure. So an object like that, illuminated under a single light source, like we've always been doing, in your box, and try your best to construct the volume of the object by paying careful attention to the planar structure and how you're seeing the planar structure um, because of the way light is revealing it. Okay. Um, is that, does that make sense to everybody? Yep. Yes. Okay, so um, again, that um, you should, you tomorrow will be an independent um, work period. So you should, you know, ideally use tomorrow's class session to do this. It's intended as a one class session assignment. Um, you know, obviously, if you want to do it later in the day, or, uh, you know, I, I won't look at them until Monday. So really any time between now and Monday. Uh, but the, the, you know, the idea is to use tomorrow's class time to do it. I have a question. Uh -huh. So we're taking a picture of the object like last time first, and then drawing it, painting it. Well, you want no. So you want to do the 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 painting of the object from life. You want from to be life. Able to the actual object. Okay. Do that from life. So this is not a class about painting from photographs. Because that's a whole different issue. No, no, no. I mean, you know how we took a picture of the egg in the box? Yeah. So you do want to, when you submit the, when you submit your painting, you also want to submit a setup. photograph of the setup. Yeah. Setup. Okay. Yeah. That's what I meant. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, yes, that's right. All right. Um, and I'll, again, be available. You make it look so easy, Professor. <laughs> I've done it many times. Um, okay. Um, professor, um, I wanted to clarify just some of the um, some of the assignment like titles and the due dates. Okay. Because there's on the syllabus there's the planar structure, which is this one. Then there's and there's no due date for that. And yeah, then there's don't look at this the um, a syllabus. The syllabus is always a rough draft in effect. Look at the assignments as they're posted on Blackboard. Okay. So just um, go to Blackboard, go to the assignments tab. That has everything, the due date. It has a more full, full description. And sometimes our class, depending on you know, the pace of the individuals, sometimes it, it goes off schedule from the syllabus. So the syllabus is more of a rough draft go by the assignments on Blackboard. Okay, and when is the um, barring a composition image due? Well, the next, the next, um, a, the next process, the ne sorry, the next stage in the process will be due next Monday. Um, I'll explain that in more detail on Thursday. Okay, thank you so much. Um, yeah. Okay, so the, the, the life one that we're doing now with the fruit or the vegetable, we have to use 11 by 14 or we using a nine by 12? Well, I, I think that it would be best, you can use either surface, it doesn't matter, but I think it would be best to use the canvas board. So I think that's your 11 by 14. Okay. Okay. 
um, Professor, uh, what are we going to do on Thursday? Thursday, I'm going to do another demonstration. So that means for that demonstration, so probably for next week, we're going to going to do two paintings, right? Yes. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay. So we're not using the canvas, the canvas paper. Well, we will be, but not yet. Not right now. Okay. No problem. Okay. Um, so if there aren't any other questions, I'll end the session for today. Um, Professor. Yes. Uh, yesterday, I kind of missed the meeting with you. Can I like uh, do it after? Uh, sure. Yeah, I can meet with you. Yeah, at the end of class. Thank you. All right, just to just to clarify really quick, we are not meeting tomorrow. We're going to work on this pepper and this pepper or vegetable is not due until Monday the 19th. That's right. Okay, great. Thank you. We are meeting on Thursday, though, right? Yes, we are meeting on Thursday. Okay, thank you. I just don't want to miss anything. Yeah. You can't miss anything. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so thank you. Uh, uh, Claude, why don't you stay on and otherwise, yeah. Uh, yeah. otherwise I'll end the session for today. Thanks everybody. Okay, Bye, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a Thank great you. Bye. Bye.